the central London. Liam Fox is about to speak. The historic decision by the British people to leave the European Union has presented this country with a number of choices about its future global direction. It has generated a great deal of soul searching and caused a number of important questions to be aired. Some of these relate specifically to the referendum decision itself. Others are questions which needed to be addressed anyway, but have been brought into sharper focus by that decision. Where do we see our place in the world? What sort of economy and what sort of country do we want to be? What should our influence be in global affairs and global trade? And how will we generate the income we will need to ensure a prosperous and secure future for the generations that come after us. Since the referendum vote and the creation of the Department for International Trade, my ministerial team and I have undertaken over 150 overseas visits to all parts of the globe, to old friends and new allies alike, and to markets large and small. From across the world, the keenness to deepen trade and investment ties with this country and once again hear us champion the case for free trade is palpable. And why should that surprise us? The United Kingdom is one of the largest and most successful economies. We are at record levels of employment. Our success is underpinned by a legal system whose reputation is second to none. We have a skilled workforce and a low tax and a well-regulated economy. We are home to some of the world's finest universities. Our research and development capabilities are cutting edge and our financial institutions world leading. We are in the right time zone to trade with Asia in the morning and the United States in the afternoon. And of course, we speak English, the language of global business. In 2017, we saw the highest level of foreign direct investment projects landing in the United Kingdom in our history as the world's leading companies offered a strong vote of confidence in the future of our economy. And this was matched by an increase of some 11% in the value of our exports. In 2017, 617 billion pounds <coughs> of UK goods and services were sold overseas, narrowing our trade deficit by just under seven billion pounds. The second half of 2017 also saw strong growth in manufacturing output. Partly as a result of this improved export performance, order books for British manufacturers remained well above their long-term average. And this is testament to the hard work and dedication from British businesses, large and small, up and down the UK. We also saw a continued explosion of interest in British tech and innovation. In the last year, we've had more than 58,000 tech startups in our country and more venture capital in tech was invested in London last year than in the whole of Germany, France, Spain and Ireland put together. And this all adds up to an extremely positive picture, one which should give us confidence in dealing with the global challenges that lie ahead and the opportunities that we must seize. This confidence is key to being able to take advantage of a dramatically shifting picture around the world where previous assumptions are being challenged, where influence is moving, and where new markets are blossoming. I often repeat the fact that the IMF estimates that in the next 10 to 15 years, 90%, 90% of global economic growth will originate from outside the European Union. This is not in any way to diminish the importance of Europe as an economic market and partner, but merely to point out the scale of the shift in global economic activity so that we are orientated towards the most income generating parts of the global economy. The thriving economies of South and East Asia and increasingly Africa are and will become even more important as their newfound prosperity drives demand for the goods and services of the developed countries prepared to interact with their markets. By 2020, China's middle class is expected to number 600 million. And by 2050, Africa on its own will represent 54% of the world popul population increase. By 2030, China will have over 220 cities 
with a population greater than one million people. The whole of Europe will have 35. And on top of the vast Asia-Pacific growth, it's predicted that there will be 1.1 billion middle-class Africans by 2060. Such a shift, not just in global demographics, but in the rise of the collective wealth of developing countries, will determine where the golden opportunities of the future will be and where we must be too. Markets are already out there for the best that Britain has to offer. I see it on every overseas trade visit that I make. For UK export goods, from top-end fashion to high-quality cars to scotch whisky to high-end manufacturing, the demand is growing. For professional services too, from accountancy to law or education or life sciences or financial services, these newly emergent middle classes will need more of the skills where we are already world class. And it's here that we will find the United Kingdom's unique comparative advantage. We must, as a country, set our sights on this future. We have to take a long-term view and our future must be global because the pattern of our trade is changing. 57% of Britain's exports are now to outside the EU, compared with only 46% in 2006. What is more, while our EU exports are still dominated by goods, our non-EU exports are evenly split between goods and services. Our approach should not be premised on simply identifying how much of our current relationship we want to keep, but what we need to prosper in a rapidly changing global environment. We cannot let the practices and the patterns of the past constrain the opportunities of the future. We require an economic outlook that allows us to take advantage of the substantial opportunities that Europe will continue to bring but without limiting our ability to adapt to a changing and growing world beyond the European continent. The UK is perfectly placed to partner with the economic powerhouses of the future and they in turn are eager for the mutual prosperity that such a partnership would bring. To do this we need the ability to exercise a fully independent trade policy. We have to maximise our overall trading opportunities for the UK to secure the prosperity of our people. Now, in the first speech I gave as Secretary of State for International Trade, I set out Britain's proud tradition of defending both the concept and the practice of free trade. Time and time again, studies have found evidence of a strong positive correlation between economic openness and growth. During the 1990s, per capita income grew three times faster in the developing countries that lowered trade barriers than in those that didn't. That effect is not confined to developing countries either. The OECD growth project found that a 10% increase in trade exposure was associated with a 4% rise in income per capita. In other words, free trade works. Globalisation has been of huge and sustainable benefit to the world economy, including through trade, specialisation and innovation. Increased competition, economies of scale and global value chains have all contributed to a productivity revolution, boosting the output of businesses across the globe. And when free trade agreements are reached, the positive effect on businesses, industries and economies can be remarkable. The EU-Korea Free Trade Agreement, which came into effect in July 2011, is just one example. In the year before the deal was agreed, the UK beer and cider industry sold almost nothing to Korea. Exports were under £2 million. By 2017, however, sales to South Korea have exploded to over £93 million. Now, free trade can be particularly important for developing countries as they gain access to new cutting-edge technologies and millions more consumers of their goods. As the world's emerging and developing economies have liberalised trade practices, 
prosperity has spread, bringing industry, jobs and wealth where there was once only deprivation. According to the World Bank, the three decades between 1981 and 2010 witnessed the single greatest decrease in material deprivation in human history. A billion people were taken out of abject poverty in just one generation. That is why it is morally unthinkable to reject free and open trade. And it's not just overseas markets that benefits, uh, the benefit from free trade. We do so here at home as well. Although it might not always be noticed, the wider benefits of a liberal trade policy are shared by consumers and households across the country by providing a wider choice of goods at a lower price. It provides supermarkets with the ability to sell us a full range of foods all year round. It enables electronic retailers to sell us increasingly sophisticated technology at lower prices from TVs to computers to mobile phones. And all this helps incomes go further. For example, in the decade to 2006, the real import price of clothing fell by 38%, a real help for families with children. But more than lower prices, open markets allow consumers the ability to choose where they source their goods to ensure sustainability and the propagation of our wider values, including our environmental agenda and maintaining the highest standards in the food that we can buy. As with many freedoms, free and open trade can be taken for granted. But the reality is that these freedoms and the benefits that they bestow have been hard won and have to continually be defended from the siren call of protectionism and the anti-trade lobby. That is why our vision for a post-Brexit Britain is one of leadership. The UK is already a committed member of the World Trade Organization, a body which is the home of the international rules-based trading system that we fully support. Currently, our direction and action within the WTO is determined by our membership of the EU. But soon, the UK will regain the full authority of independent membership. We will establish our own trading schedules. We are taking the necessary steps so that on leaving the EU, we will accede to the agreement on government procurement and we'll begin to exercise our independent voice. The UK stands ready to offer clear leadership, to be a staunch defender of trading rights and freedoms, not only at the WTO, but at other international bodies too. Moreover, we can help forge the way on the liberalization of those areas of global trade where the WTO and other bodies have yet to extend their reach, services, digital trade, and the knowledge economy. The digital economy is growing 32% faster than the wider economy and creating jobs three times more quickly. Digital trade is inherently transnational and e-commerce offers previously unknown opportunities for SMEs and individuals, particularly women, to take part in the globalized economy. In many areas of this important agenda, the EU has been unable to keep pace. There is a real opportunity for the UK to become a global leader in digital trade. If we are to lead, then we must ask ourselves what leadership looks like. As I alluded to earlier, part of the failure of current trading practices has been their rigidity. There's a tendency among some nations to cling to the known trading mechanisms more suited to the structures of the past than the digital age of the future. Flexibility and agility then are the key to any future trade policy. The ability to react quickly to new developments, to explore new opportunities and to nurture fledgling industries will be the key to growth and prosperity in the coming years. That's why my department is pursuing a more flexible approach to our country's trading future. There is a growing awareness that a full-blown gold-plated free trade agreement may not be the only solution in a fast-changing global economy. Fortunately, there is a global trade toolbox from which we can choose the most appropriate mechanisms for liberalizing trade. These range from being members of multilateral agreements to mutual recognition agreements and the sort of 
outcome-based equivalence approach recently advanced by the Governor of the Bank of England. We will consider multi-country alliances of the like-minded, right down to bilateral arrangements, using all the advantages available to us from our diplomatic network to the system of prime ministerial trade envoys. All of these options are available, but only to countries with independent trade policies. In the past 20 months of DIT's existence, this work has begun in earnest. We have opened 14 informal trade dialogues with 21 countries from the United States to Australia to the UAE, and these will lay the groundwork for future trade agreements, but will also work to identify those non-tariff barriers to trade that can be removed earlier. We've begun appointing a new network of Her Majesty's Trade Commissioners based in market, able to maximise exports and investment free from centralised Whitehall targets. And with a presence in 108 countries and working across government, DIT is a fully integrated trade department bringing together investment, export promotion, export finance and trade policy. We're currently piloting a new global growth service, increasing our support for those medium-sized businesses with international ambitions. And DIT also has an extensive range of resources available to SMEs and new exporters. For example, UK export finance has been recognised as one of the world's most innovative and flexible export credit agencies. Last year, UK EF provided £3 billion in support, helping 221 UK companies sell to 63 countries around the world, and 79% of these companies were SMEs. Our cutting-edge digital platform, great.gov.uk, was launched in November 2016 and has since been visited by over 2.8 million users. And we are reviewing our wider strategy on exports and investment, including undertaking an export strategy review, working alongside the industrial strategy to identify what more we can do to help exports large and small across the whole of the UK, businesses maximizing their export potential. We're working hard to create the right framework for business, and especially our small and medium-sized businesses, to enable them to make the most of their innovation, ingenuity and expertise that are the cornerstone of our economy. So what does all of this mean for our future relationship with the European Union and beyond? For those firms that trade with the European Union, keeping all of the EU's regulations, the customs union, the single market and the external tariffs sounds like an easy option. But we cannot allow our future to be determined by our past. Instead, we should turn our sail and tack into the global trading winds of the future. We should fully exploit our own natural advantages to unlock the vital prosperity we need. We should be able to offer better preferential agreements and work more closely with a range of developing countries. And we should build a trade policy that works for the long-term interests of businesses, citizens and future generations. Now, there's been a lot of debate in recent days about the EU's customs union. As we are leaving the European Union, necessarily we cannot remain in the customs union, which is open only to EU member states. And the alternative has been proposed that we enter a new customs union with the European Union. But what would this mean? First of all, for goods, we would have to accept EU trade rules without any say in how they were made, handing Brussels considerable control over the UK's external trade policy. Secondly, it would limit our ability to reach new trade agreements with the world's fastest growing economies. And thirdly, it would limit our ability to develop our trade and development policies that would offer new ways for the world's poorest nations to trade their way out of poverty. And what would a customs union actually consist of? Which sectors would be covered? Would it be like Turkey, which has a customs union, but only for industrial goods and some agricultural products? Whatever it covered, should such a customs union be negotiated, we would be forced to allow goods from other countries into our markets tariff-free on terms set by Brussels without any tariff-free access to the markets of other countries in return. And 
if we were to disagree, Brussels could simply overrule us. Those on the political left who opposed TTIP, the agreement between the European Union and the United States, might want to consider that in a customs union, they would have to implement any elements of TTIP, whether they liked them or not, in any sectors covered by a customs union. As rule takers, without any say in how the rules were made, we would be in a worse position than we are today. It would be a complete sellout of Britain's national interests and a betrayal of the voters in the referendum. Then there is the issue of constraints on the ability to negotiate independent trade arrangements. A customs union would remove the bulk of incentives for other countries to enter into comprehensive free trade agreements with the UK. If we were unable to alter the rules in whole sectors of our economy, as Turkey has now discovered. The inevitable price of trying to negotiate with one arm tied behind our back is that we would become less attractive to potential trade partners and forfeit many of the opportunities that would otherwise be available to us. And then there is a question of our ability to help developing countries in the way that we would like. Not only does the EU have a high average external tariff, 5.1% compared, for example, to the US, 3.5%, but it continues to operate tariffs in a way that particularly disadvantaged countries who want to add value to their primary commodities and move up value chains. As we leave the EU, we are committed to maintaining preferential access for developing countries. Outside the customs union, we would have the freedom to expand access and tackle barriers to trade to enable poorer countries genuinely to trade their way out of poverty and become less dependent on our aid budgets. Many NGOs who look to Britain to lead in this area would find their aims frustrated by membership of a customs union. Remaining in a customs union of any type would only make sense if we were to abandon our global ambitions and limit our abilities to shape our trade policy to the changes in the global environment that I have outlined. Tomorrow's choices would be constrained by today's status quo. We would deny ourselves the opportunity to shape Britain's place in the future world economy and our ability to influence the direction of that economy itself. Of course, the government's aim is to ensure that UK companies, as well as those from abroad, retain the maximum freedom to trade with and operate within European markets. We want European businesses to do the same in the UK. That is why we want to develop customs arrangements which lead to trade being as frictionless as possible at our borders in a tariff-free environment with as few non-tariff barriers as possible. And on Northern Ireland, it is of course as precious a part of our United Kingdom as any other. So it's vital that it has a full share in our future prosperity and our opportunities as a trading nation. The avoidance of a hard border in Northern Ireland is of crucial importance, as is the prevention of trade barriers between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. We believe that a comprehensive and liberal trading agreement with the EU is the best way to deal with the crucially important issue of avoiding that hard border. Britain has vigorously supported the trade agreements reached between the European Union and other countries, such as Canada and Japan. And we've done so because we believe in the principle of free trade, but also because we believe it's the best way to increase the prosperity of the people of Britain and the rest of Europe. And we believe the same principles should apply to the agreement between the UK and the EU itself as we move away from the political constraints of the Union. We do so as one of the world's largest economies with a strong alignment to the EU. We understand that outside the EU, we will no longer have influence in the Council of Ministers, the Commission, or the European Parliament, where EU rules will be made. But it would not be in the interests of the EU or the UK to introduce unnecessary restrictions 
on trade and investment across the European continent, for it would send a signal to global investors that Europe was less open for business than it is at present. And we want an economically vibrant EU to be a major partner for the future in a deep and special partnership. Our negotiations must be focused on delivering a partnership that will support the prosperity, stability and security of both EU and UK citizens. And it will need to be a bespoke relationship. We are not Canada or Norway or Switzerland. We are Britain and what's more, we want to be a truly global Britain. A global Britain with ambitions to maximise our trade opportunities both inside and outside the EU. A global Britain that wants the freedom to work with global partners and a global Britain which seeks to minimise any barriers to trade because it all comes down to flexibility and agility in what will be an increasingly competitive global economic environment. The UK must regain the ability to negotiate our own trade arrangements with our own partners. To surrender this would be to endanger not only our long-term prosperity and the innovation and dynamism that will ensure that Britain remains a leading economic power, but also our ability to influence this new trading landscape in a way that reflects UK values and interests. We have been given a historic opportunity to reorientate our economy. We will have to ensure that we put the prosperity, stability and security of our people first. But we must also remember that history, experience and values are vital navigational tools and that confidence, optimism and vision will always deliver more than pessimism or self-doubt. The prize at stake is not simply the future prosperity of the United Kingdom, but our ability to participate in and shape the world economy at one of the most exciting and important points in history. It's about moving away from the concepts that defined our activities in the 20th century to new ways of viewing the opportunities of the 21st. It's about breaking down barriers, opening up markets and providing opportunities so that the benefits of free trade can be enjoyed not only by the next generation in this country, but so that some of the world's poorest can share in the fruits of our prosperity. We are at a crossroads with a historic opportunity to help shape our global future for the better. And we have a duty to grasp it. Thank you. <clears throat>Well, that was uh, Dr. Liam Fox. Um, he was said that uh, um, accepting the EU trade rules without any say uh, in how they are made would be detrimental to the United Kingdom. Uh, Q&A has just begun. Let's have a listen in. Uh, it may, may, um, it may um, be winter outside, as they say, but here in Bloomberg, it uh, feels like the height of summer. Uh, Hi. Secretary of State. Um, your former permanent secretary, Sir Martin Donnelly, has likened the plan you just outlined to swapping a three-course meal for a packet of crisps. What's your response to that? And are you concerned there are some in the British establishment who still don't accept Brexit and want to stop it? And the second point I'd like to raise with you is... The first one had at least three points. William, William Haig, your, your own former leader, has today said that uh, Conservatives who vote to keep the UK in the customs union... Uh, will effectively be helping bring down the government and usher in Jeremy Corbyn. Is he right? Well, first of all, um, it's unsurprising that those who spent a lifetime working within the, uh, uh, the European Union would see uh, moving away from the European Union as being threatening. The particular choice that I heard Sir Martin Donnelly outline that was a choice between the European Union and trade opportunities elsewhere and the continuation of EU trade agreements, I don't believe that is the choice that we face. We are already uh, trying to seek a full 
uh, and liberal partnership with the European Union. We are already having discussions about expanding our trade agreements beyond the EU and we're also talking about rolling over the EU agreements into UK law so that we get no disruption in terms of market access at the point of exit. So it's not a choice of one or the other uh, and in any case I think the UK Brexit process is, as we've all discovered, a little more uh, complex than a packet of walkers. Um, when it comes to the other issues, I hope that we'll be able to persuade our colleagues, as the Prime Minister sets out the case that the Cabinet decided at Chequers last week that they will find that persuasive and they will understand that the benefits of the approach that the Prime Minister will set out will actually uh, be to the greater prosperity and security of the people of this country and I hope they will understand that the, the drawbacks of the customs union that I've set out today would remarkably hinder this country uh, in terms of the future economic opportunities that might otherwise be available. Um, uh, Federation of Small Businesses, Craig. Uh, thank you for the speech. Um, we've heard a lot about big business views over the last 24 hours, and I wondered if you could spell out for us more clearly the uh, potential benefits to smaller businesses of an independent UK trade policy, and how do we increase small business exporters and importers from one in three to one in two? Um, or, or more. Um, we, as you know, we've been having, uh, as a department, taking a great deal of interest in how we get more SMEs into exporting. We've taken changes uh, in things like export finance, so where small businesses up till October last year had to go through a lengthy process to try to apply for export finance. We've now got delegated powers to the banks, so you can walk into a bank as an SME, be told within a few minutes whether you'd be eligible for UK export finance and complete a deal in days. We've also, as part of our wider engagement and part of our discussions with the United States, for example, uh, decided that we want to have an SME forum and we've got 100 businesses taking part in the next uh, round of our trade dialogue group. We do need to try to open all of this up and part of the way of opening that up is getting better access to the digital economy. Digital economy, e-commerce are ways in which small businesses can easily take advantage of a global marketplace um, and the UK will want to see liberalisation of that as we move forward. As you're well aware, uh, one of the problems that we've had in taking trade agreements forward, it came up again in, at the WTO in Argentina, was that there are problems and differences of opinion in the EU about data localization. We believe that for a properly functioning global economy, you have to be able to move goods and services and data, and that will be absolutely essential for SMEs. Um, British exporters, Geoffrey. Hello. Um, there are a number of barriers for businesses exporting or to increase their exports today. One of them is attitude to, to exporting. How can governments further assist in changing that attitude? And equally, how can businesses who are already exporting assist in inspiring others to export more? Well, um, extremely good questions because part of our problem is cultural and part of our problem is the actual business experience. Now, government can do a lot more about the latter, and we, by expanding our overseas network, by putting UK export finance experts into market, as we have done, we can actually make some of those barriers diminish at the point of exporting itself. We can also, as we've done through great.gov.uk, give companies better information about the sort of cultures they'll be exporting into, and the sort of barriers they may face, and the sort of help that government might be able to give. On the cultural front, I think we are beginning to see a change. As I said right at the beginning of the remarks that I made, some of the questions that we're asking today are as a result of the referendum. Some of them had to be asked anyway. Why was it that the UK was exporting only 28% of its GDP when Germany was exporting 47%? Do we have to look at the way that our companies are financed? Do we have to look at debt financing you know, versus other ways uh, of financing small and growing companies? But the good news is that many companies across this country have already risen to the challenge. Preliminary figures for 2017 suggest that not only have we passed 28% of our GDP that we export, but we've actually passed 30% by a margin that may be one of our best export performances for many decades. So I think that the, the, the understanding is out there that the European debate has brought focus 
onto some of our other exporting performance. We will do what we can, but I hope that in your organization, you hold up those companies that have successfully exported so that when people say, it's too difficult for me, you can say, as we have in our latest campaign, if I can, you can. Posters you'll be seeing around the country quite soon. Um, Simon. Uh, Secretary of State, um, in his speech yesterday, Jeremy Corbyn uh, said that Labour was opposed to the NHS and other public services being part of a trade agreement with Trump's America or a, a, a revived TTIP uh, uh, type deal with the EU, uh, saying it would open the door to a flood of further privatisations. How do you respond to the charge that these agreements you want to put in place around the world uh, are going to allow foreign companies to come to the UK and cause privatisations of our key public services? Well, we have always said that in any future trade agreements, we will absolutely preserve the right of governments to regulate their public services. That has been a given in most trade agreements in the recent past. We are absolutely committed to that. But I have to say, you can only do that if you're actually in control of the agreement itself. If you sign up to a customs union, you'll have to accept the agreements that are reached by others without you having any say in it. And if you don't like what they decide, that's tough because you'll have them applied to you. So my message to the incoherent, inept and clueless performance of the Labour Party in recent days is you can't wish the outcomes without wishing the means to deliver those outcomes. And there doesn't seem to have been much thought given to what could be imposed upon the United Kingdom through a customs union if we didn't want it. The approach that I set out is UK control over UK trade policy. What the Labour Party is setting out is a dive into the unknown and having to accept rules that are made by others and not by themselves. And it was interesting that as Jeremy Corbyn was giving his speech yesterday, the leader of the Welsh Labour Party was in the United States telling them how quickly they wanted a new independent trade agreement with the United States. You can't make it up, it'd be funny if it wasn't so tragic. Very last question, John Pinar. Dr. Fox, given that your former head of department has said you'd need a fairy godmother to get the kind of have cake and eat it deal that he says, he says you want with the European Union, and you yourself have said that British business needs to raise its game to take full advantage of Brexit. Is the greatest danger that Brexit could lead to national self-harm or that there simply aren't enough true believers like you? I think that we need to set out an ambitious programme for the United Kingdom. It's not about sticking to the patterns of the past. And I understand, as I say, that those who have been professionally committed to those for many years would want to adhere to them. I want to think beyond where we are today to the opportunities available to the future. The fact, as I said at the beginning, that the IMF has pointed out that 90% of global growth will be outside the European continent in the next 10 to 15 years. We cannot afford to be bound by the practices and the patterns of the past. We have to take the opportunities available unfettered by those who would make the rules on our behalf. And as I said, neither Sir Martin, with all due respect, nor anyone else, has seen the full details of what was agreed at Cabinet last week at Chequers. And when the Prime Minister sets those out on, uh, on Friday, I think he will find that what we need is a hard-headed leader, not a fairy godmother. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Liam Fox uh, walking off the stage a little quicker than we'd anticipated, uh, giving a speech about uh, the prospects for Britain's trade uh, after we leave the EU, saying that it is not in the interest of the UK or the EU to put in place barriers to trade, again, saying that the avoidance of a hard border with Northern Ireland is very, very important, and, and basically suggesting that it, were we to stay in the customs union, as Jeremy Corbyn suggested yesterday, we'll be constrained from taking advantage of future trade opportunities. Let's bring in our political editor, Faisal Islam, who's in central London. And Faisal, perhaps no surprise that he was keen to pour cold water over Jeremy Corbyn's comments yesterday. Yes, we've got a real political battle now on our hands between the two main parties in UK politics. Liam Fox saying, I think it was inept, uh, clueless and incompetent, uh, the Labour leader's performance as regards his plan uh, to stay in some form of customs union 
post-Brexit. Uh, uh, you might argue he would say that, wouldn't he? His international trade secretary wants maximum freedom to be able to negotiate new trade.